Generally Famous is proudly brought to you by Trade Depot. Generally famous for saving Kiwis thousands. Call into one of the stores or visit online at tradedepot.co.nz. Kia ora, Aotearoa, and welcome to Generally Famous. I'm Simon Bridges, and every week I talk to generally famous but always interesting guests about life, love, and what makes them tick. This week we have Kiwi Paralympic great stand-up comedian, sometimes tech professional, Liam Malone. Welcome, Liam. Thanks for having me, Simon. I don't know about have you had a long, hard week? Mm. I've been travelling up and down the country with work, so it's been a very busy week. And my dog, my dog is an escape artist. He escaped twice in one day, made it onto the local lost and found dog page. Oh no. I've so he's had, a community terror. Do you feel embarrassed about that? As a sort of, as a high profile sort of guy, it's like Liam Malone's dog is out on the loose. I've had that in Matua Tauranga, which no, I don't live at anymore, but he's it's rogue. been on the Facebook page. Yeah, no, we, we, we match. Same energy, right. so... He's super friendly. Every time he's captured by one of our neighbours, like on Wednesday he got two, two K away, made it to a park, rolled in a bunch of snapper carcasses <laughs> and was captured by this very lovely lady who then rung me saying she'd captured uh, Moose. Brilliant. And as soon as you're sort of, I, I, this wasn't where I intended to start and we'll get back on track soon, but your girlfriend partner, Madison Reedy, News Hub reporter, I feel like... I'm sure I've been bruised by her in some sort of interview at some point in time in my life, but now she's, you know, gone on to bigger and better things in the corporate world. Yeah, she's head of content at Jardin, and you would have undoubtedly been bruised by her, as as I have, <laughs> not, as not, I have. Not, not literally, but metaphorically, we all Correct. understand that. So you sound like you've got a life of sort of idyllic bliss. With I a, have a wonderful life, it's hectic, but it's wonderful. Fantastic. I want to go back, sort of. Let's let's go to let's go to the Rio Paralympics 2016. You won two golds in a 200 and in, in the 200 and 400 meters. You won silver at 100 meters. Um, amazing. You were um, incredibly fast. You are still the second fastest 400 meters New Zealand ever. Something like that. I mean, it's like boom. Once upon a time, now I'd be lucky to run 400 metres. But at my peak, that was certainly true. I think I I would have been the fastest. It was a horrible experience in Rio, so I didn't break that record, unfortunately. Legs or not. Um, But would have been capable of doing so. I'm sure I've run faster than that. So that's in terms of para-Olympics, but actually also, like overall, I mean, it's seriously fast. Yeah, so like I would have been the fastest in New Zealand, legs or not. Yeah, able-bodied, disabled, whatever. How did it feel to win? Anticlimactic. It's not like winning the lottery when you go to the Olympics or the Paralympics. Yeah. It's, you know, three, four years of a cycle before the next Games. Hard work. If you win a gold medal in the Olympics or the Paralympics, you get $60,000. If you divide that by the amount of time that you spend training over three or four years, you know, you're not on minimum. No. You're not on minimum wage. No. And it's, it's a hard life. You get up 5 a.m., you train. You go back in the afternoon, you train. You spend the middle of your day either working or at university or in some other pursuit if you're ambitious. And And then you then you've got a round medal and some money, but Yeah, you get a medal and, and the, you're like, the oh, next okay. day is and just then, another day. Correct, exactly. The the joy of the Paralympics is outside of the competition because it's such a bizarre event. And um, I'll get into that, but maybe I explain why I went to the Paralympics and yep. not the Olympics, because I've got two fake legs. Yeah. Uh, so I was born with and I'd usually lie about this and give you some terrible spiel about losing my leg in a shark attack. But I was born with fibula hemimelia, which is the yeah. absence of the fibula bone. It runs down behind the tibia. So yep. I didn't have that at birth when I was learning to walk. Both my ankles snapped. I learned to walk on the insides of my feet. I've seen that sort of those videos. Yeah, video. never going to be sustainable. So they chopped both my legs off. And then fast forward, you know, 19 years, I was in a terrible space and then decided that I'd become a and world wanna, champion. Yeah, and I want to talk about that, but that's right. So, and, and you, well, you didn't just cite, and you did. Mm. Um, and, but so just on that Olympics, though, that's, so that's, I didn't actually know that. Well, and I know what you're saying on a sort of a wage over time basis, it's maybe not, you know, you're not going to be a millionaire, but you get 120K because you won two? No. You get, you're sorry, 60. you get 50, you get 50K, you get an extra 10 for the, so the marginal value of earning a second goal like. is diminishing at like a rapid pace but uh. you know the i guess bell curve of like income for an olympic athlete is just like pretty much zero and then if you're in the like top 0.1 percent you're a high earner so like that would be through sponsorships through speaking fees yep. and everything else but besides that it's a a very uh 
I don't know what, a, a, not, not a wealthy pursuit. No, and the sensation of running on blades. I mean, I obviously haven't done, done it. G- g- well, you could give amputate us a, both of your legs and you could give it yeah, a shot. Well, I wouldn't recommend well, it. Well, what's the feeling like of, of that, that, that running on blades? Well, so I grew up with wooden legs and it feels a lot better than that, but it doesn't feel that great still. So my legs. So it's was, not comfortable. It's just not comfortable. The easiest way to explain it to someone who's listening is imagine you're wearing a shoe, but the shoe's a size too small than what you'd normally wear and it's made of carbon fiber and it rubs around your foot and causes it to bleed and bruise. And that's what it's like to wear my prosthetics with the amputation that I have. And when you wear blades, it's that, but it's a little bit bouncier. So you'd run really fast. It's, it's epic, a, don't get me wrong. There's a bounce to it. It's there's a, a little bit of a bounce to it, but the stiffer the blade is, the less bounce there is, and you run a little bit faster. So it's actually better right. to have it not bouncy because you're spending all this time with the blade compressing on the ground like a spring, when what you really want is that spring to compress and decompress as fast as possible. And that happens by it being stiff. And the equivalent to that for someone who's able-bodied is you want your tendons and muscles to be super stiff so that they're... Fast twitch. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be like spending all this time compressing your muscle and then extending. You, you won't be very fast. Just sort of briefly on the prosthetics. You would have several different kinds of artificial legs um, that you'll be putting on depending on what you're doing. Have I got that right? Correct. So I have obviously legs that I walk around in during the day. Uh, legs that I have for diving and spearfishing where the foot can rotate uh, you know, an extra 90 degrees so that it's lengthways so I can kick with fins on. I have legs for running. I could get legs for snowboarding, but I tend to wear the legs that I'm wearing for everyday walking. But right. you can get these awesome legs that have like a fox shock from, that would be the same as like a the rear end of a mountain bike shock. And that goes to the front of the toes that then connects to the shin of the prosthetic and they're awesome for snowboarding. So for any type of activity that you're doing, you can adapt a prosthetic to the specificity of that activity. Amazing, and if we think about the Olympics, it's probably four other things as well, but it's a combination of your athleticism and all that training you've done and the technology, right? And um, I, I was really struck by something, you know, you've said about what you, your dad said to you, you know, that growing up, you know, with the pain and the teasing and so on, he, he said to you, know, someday, someone's going to build you legs, the technology is going to allow you to run faster and better. Tell me about the, the technology that goes into those, those ones for elite running and sprints. Yeah, and you hit the nail on the head. So the Paralympics is in some capacity the intersection of technology and human performance, more so than I think the Olympics is. The blade running capacity, so the blade prosthetic, is a... Uh, design using biomimicry so it uses the design of the hind leg of a cheetah as its inspiration for its shape which is the opposite of like the human shape of a foot so that's super awesome and then it's made of like a carbon composite so it's lighter than a normal leg and it's stiffer than a normal leg and of course it doesn't fatigue like a normal leg because it's not real so when you weigh those things up um, over 100 meters it doesn't allow you to be faster than, I guess, an able-bodied person. Over 400, 800, you begin to see the, I guess, marginal improvement between technology and human biology, which is pretty cool. Amazing, amazing. There's Um, no way that I would have been that fast had I had real legs. So that's quite cool. Yeah, amazing. Um, Your ones at Rio, for example, would be unique to you and so there's all these, and so, you know, Jimmy from Mozambique or whoever's there, they, 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 they're running. And so this is all part of, as you say, that combination and the who's most athletic, you know, who's kind of a bit like the America's Cup. Correct. And that's why there's this massive challenge around the disparity in equality for competition when you have developing countries who don't have, I guess, expertise in carbon composite right. manufacturing and then you have a country like New Zealand and it has carbon fiber for rockets for uh, the America's Cup for whatever. We can build these incredible blades, uh, which obviously gives me a huge advantage. For the most part, my blades were the same as everyone else's, besides the fact that I discovered making a blade stiffer 
changing the angle of it a little bit mm, led to massive improvements. So who's doing this with you? You you are obviously I mean you you you're right up on this and I mean you're we'll come to it but you're a technophile, you're a tech savvy guy, you work in the tech sector. Um give me a sense of you know how you're kind of working with them to get what you think is going to be basically like, you know, someone from the United States or whoever, but but you're trying to tweak it and get it right for you and to give you the edge. Yeah, lots of groups were involved. So there was the manufacturer of prosthetics, which comes out of Iceland. They are a very well, R&D-centric team. You have AUT, which is connected to High Performance Sport up the Millennium Institute, which is the Olympic Training Centre in New Zealand. On the shore. Correct. Yep. And then you have High Performance Sport. And so you have data scientists. You have, of course, all of your coaches and trainers. And they have a whole bunch of, I guess, data capturing techniques, along with the data analyst, analyst guys from AUT and high performance, and then you have a team in Iceland, um, and you combine all of those parties together and do some iterative feedback and produce something that's a little bit better. And you don't need massive improvements in these technologies to get like significantly different outcomes, and that's the difference between winning and losing yep. at the end of the day. Yep. Um, who came second to you? And mm. I don't know, let's go 400. <laughs> uh, Hunter Woodhull, American kid. Right. Uh, he's actually become famous on the internet, and right. uh, he's super cool. He's you know a really uh, charismatic, young, optimistic American guy. The, the most fascinating, oh, sorry to divert, the most no, interesting thing about the Paralympics is you go there and it's 10,000 people who have varying disabilities, right? And the most interesting thing about going to the Paralympics is 80% of people have overcome their disability they're absolutely hilarious. They make savagery jokes that everyday people would never accept in society right. about each other, right? It's just like yeah. if PC people were there, they would melt. Yeah. And uh, and then you have 20% of people where, uh, you know, they might their disability might not even be severe. It might be like minor cerebral palsy. They might have a missing hand or something. You might be like me, an amputee, and life's pretty normal. And they're still miserable. Or you might have a guy with no arms, no legs, and... They're absolutely hilarious. They're super positive, and it doesn't bother them at all. And you know, it's just one of those realizations that you had from being at that event that it really doesn't matter what's kind of going on in life. It's like your attitude and your perception towards it, and how you overcome these things that makes all the difference. And going back to Hunter, he was one of the people that I met who was kind of like me, super optimistic. C amputee or double amputee? Yeah. yeah. So, so the way that the Paralympic is structured, Paralympics is structured in terms of races is double amputees and single amputees below the knee compete each other, against each other. And I think that's changed now where they've separated them right. because being a double amputee over 400 metres is a huge advantage because single amputees have uh, one leg that fatigues. Yes, Obviously, their right. biological leg fatigues. Right. But over a 100 metres, a single leg amputee has an advantage because they can generate power from zero kilometres an hour out of the starting blocks because right. they have muscles in their calves. So yeah, so Hunter came second in the 400, he came third, oh no, he didn't, uh, he came second in the 200, and uh, then I can't remember who came third. I suppose I was interested, why, why do you, given that complex combination of factors that go into winning, say, a 400 metres at the Paralympic, why do you reckon you had the edge on him? Uh, Hopefully he <clears> won't <throat> be listening, so. <laughs> there, there won't be. One, <laughs> one, I was just better. Mm-hmm. Two, I was very lucky in the people that I had around me. My coach was absolutely phenomenal. So for two years leading into it, I was training by and large by myself. I had a coach in Nelson who'd write me programs, but I trained by myself every single day in Wellington with no team. I then moved to Auckland under the Olympic umbrella. I had an incredible coach. He corrected my training. That made a massive difference on the biological side. Then we had the technology solution. You combine those two. I don't think other athletes focused on the technology side as much as I did, so which gave me a technological advantage in that capacity. But also then you just have like my personality and my character when it comes to competition. These guys all took the Paralympics very seriously. I get that the Paralympics is this giant event, but the fact that there were 10,000 people with disabilities around me, I couldn't take it seriously in some capacity the whole time because for a lot of it I was I was laughing. Right. And Beyond that, at the end of the day, you're just running around in a circle, right? It's not as important as being the leader of a country, being a doctor saving lives, whatever. So it's easy for me to reduce to it not being the most important thing in the world and not getting caught up in the moment. Whereas... And that helped? Massively, because I competed against these guys outside of the Paralympics. And 
um, where the event wasn't as big, and they did a lot better. And run me through the um, the athletic part of it. What, what was your? I hear what you're saying, and I get that, right? Like actually, in a way, if you were it a bit more lightly, and you're not kind of, I need to win this, and I'm gonna, you know, die if I don't. Yeah. Um, that can be an edge. That said, you were training hard. What was your kind of daily regime? Well, I overtrained for a long period of time, and like. Ugh. Nine months out, before, uh, sorry, nine weeks out before the games, before I left to go to the States and train leading into the Paralympics, we did these tests and I burnt out like I could barely finish a 400 meter race. And because I was secretly training because I was anxious about losing, so I would go to the track at like 4.30 in the morning and train secretly. And so my coach kind of discovered that. But I would typically train in the morning, I don't know, two hours and then in the afternoon, two hours. There'd be some combination between sprint work speed work power work like in terms of speed speed endurance aerobic and then strength power on the gym side as well so you have all these different components that come together especially for a 400 400 has got to be one of the hardest if not the hardest running race on earth because of its combination of yes. power speed endurance and aerobics yes. and each phase of that race has a different capacity of that which is super important and then you're out 2018, not too long after you be at the top yeah, of the podium. I really, I, yeah, it sucked. I sadly had um, two injuries in 2017. I suffered from nerve damage and then a minor bone fracture, which we didn't actually discover for another three years, which led to me getting my leg reamputated in 2020. Um, so I spent a year in crutches. Uh, I came back and then the Paralympics changed the way that the blades could be designed. And... Uh, I received this email in, informing me that that was the case, and within an hour, I decided that it was time to move on. Right. You're born in Nelson. You're not sort of emotionally scarred from that. I love no, Nelson. I mean, Nelson's a great it's city. A, it's just, a fantastic you've got the keys city. To it. I've got a sister key. in Nelson by the key. Yeah. Key, okay, to, key okay. to the city. Not that I'm not that I'm sure what that key opens the door to. <laughs> Life. Uh, Life, maybe. Liberty. Maybe a bar at three a.m. with a bunch yeah. of your mates. Who knows? Yeah. If only, um, you've, you've told us, and you, uh, fibula hemimelia, have I said that correctly? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, yeah. the absence of fibula bone, as a toddler, I've seen that, as I say, that video of you, you know, w walking, but obviously it's not um, like an able-bodied toddler would be. And your parents made a courageous decision that you would be amputated. Was that, um, I, I just, excuse my ignorance, but was that um, inevitable or could there have been another path that would have been a... The other path was not amputating, hoping that there were medical surgeries where they could insert a rod every, I don't know, six to nine months as I grew that would replace the fibula. I know someone who went down that pathway and their parents would not allow them to get their legs amputated. He spent his life in crutches. He was miserable and depressed and was suicidal up until he got his amputation done at 19. Once he had, I guess, the legal right to make that decision. Best decision of his life. He now lives a life very similar to mine. My parents made the decision to amputate. I had a fantastic orthopedic surgeon down in Nelson who Amazing. made that decision in conjunction with them. And I'm very fortunate to have a father who is uh, very optimistic about how technology just improves over time and he was like ah, you know prosthetics are very limited now and they were they were made of like wood and rubber and a bolt would screw my foot onto the rest of my prosthetic and it would come loose and my foot would spin around but his view was like over time different materials would come into the industry they would improve and i would have a very good quality of life and he was right so they made so the you, right decision your tech savvy stuff in a way comes from him does it or and the, the, the that, optimism or? the optimism right. and the, the idea that like capitalism will you know lead to as a positive influence on things like this and, and innovation like, yeah and like people will help solve everyone else's needs it's like a very larger than life a kind of macro view that things will improve and i'm very lucky to have him influence me and like you way. say god bless um, orthopedic surgeons i mean my my uh, uh one of my sons have very bad club feet you know they um they're amazing makes me makes me want to have a child who's a surgeon because you say it's really something that uh, makes a massive, massive difference. Couldn't agree more. I think you know anyone who works in the medical industry is uh, it's, a, it's a noble pursuit. Um, growing up as a double amputee, what was that like? Awesome and shit at the same time. Right. Uh, on the the downside, obviously, you grow up, you're unsure why you why this happened to you. Then my parents 
<sighs> my parents were annoying in some capacity. I should have done something that I could have been good at that would have built my confidence, like playing chess, right? I don't need real legs to learn how to right. play chess. Why are they making me do cross country? Right. Do you know what I mean? Why are you making me do a one kilometer cross country race? And, and what were the terrible um... prosthetics? Yeah. Yeah, I, I came last in my first cross country race by like 500 meters on a one kilometer race and the girls who started five minutes after me bit me so that was you know i think i ran the last 100 meters and people are yelling like yeah run for us run and uh but my mum year on year made me do it and do swimming sports my leg would absorb water and i'd start out parallel and i'd end up aqua jogging on the bottom or i'd you know play cricket the ball would hit my leg and then the umpire would say you know can the leg, kid with no legs get out leg before wicket and everyone's having a laugh and so, you know, it was just one Which endless... is sort of funny, yeah, but it's hilarious. kind of... No, it's annoying. hilarious. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. I, I, you know, from a very young age, I could at least see the funny side of it. Despite that, there were times when I would go home where it would be overbearing and I would cry and I would say to my dad, why does this happen to, have to happen to me? Why do I have to be the one with no legs? And he would, he would say things like what you mentioned earlier. You know, one day, you know, don't count yourself out. One day someone will build you legs that will allow you to run faster than your friends, I would parrot that at school. My friends are like, what are you talking about? Like, what are they gonna do? Like, build your cheetah legs? Inevitably, that was, that's, that, what that, 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 that's what happened. But outside of that, you know, having prosthetics has been fun. You know, at Intermediate, we would spray my legs with, uh, with like links. We would set them on fire at school. We would do all sorts of ridiculous <laughs> that things. That doesn't sound particularly politically correct. But no, it do, it or doesn't. health and safety friendly, I have to say. No, neither. And you were doing like, um, I mean, you were in team sports with able-bodied and able-bodied teams. You were doing rugby. Oh, man, yeah. Exactly. Which, like, and was, I'd hate to be my teammate. And I'm sorry. What a like, stitch up. But were you were you there, thereabouts with your other team members? Yeah, up until about uh, puberty. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember a story I think I've seen some time back uh, where you know you're there at a sort of a, obviously a competitive game. There's parents in the uh, crowd, and you know you're kicking a conversion, and the foot comes off. Yeah, all the time. How you... Lead goes further than the than the ball. First time I went to kick a rugby ball was like uh, with Andrew Murdens, who used to be <laughs> yeah, an all, well, all yeah. black and, right. and number 10 for the Crusaders. And I was at a pub, the Crusaders were at our, our local pub, and he asked me to kick the ball. And my leg went further than the ball and landed on the roof of the pub. And so... You get it down? I, I think the guys, they did the, like the line-out thing from the <laughs> fours. Right. You know, it's like, it's just totally comical. So, yeah, that was that was my entire childhood. How do you think it shaped your character? I mean, I'm presuming it makes you kind of tough, resilient. Um, you know, you're confident. And these things sometimes, is, do you think that's what it did for you? Or am I Absol over? Absolutely. But it's also made me like lack a little bit of empathy when I hear other people right. complain about their problems because you I've, I've been problems. through enough things and like all storms, they pass. And I think people's capacity for resiliency is much higher than they think of themselves. And just like an ability to laugh at like the, the difficulties in life. So what do you do as we talked, I think, off here? You're 28, you're in your prime. What do you do about that, um, in your words, lack of empathy? I mean, do you think now, is that something that you consciously check yourself on and say, well, you know, I know because of who I am and, you know, school of hard knocks, I'm, I've am i got kind of thing like this and I need to go out of my way to be a bit more honest, because not everyone's born shaped the same, has the same resilience. Some people uh, to take things tougher than others. That's true, but in the same respect, I think back and I'm like, ah, how should people have treated me when I was in those situations? And like, I think every situation's unique and it depends on what someone else is going through, but uh, sometimes people need some tough love as well and they think that comes from a place of respect that I know that that person can get through something or that they're just whinging and moaning, ah, which I hate. I can't stand whinges and moaners. Were you treated as different or the same growing up, do you think? The same. Yeah. Yeah, the same. That's and clearly the, what your parents wanted. And correct. Did. And yeah. the same in the sense that I was teased about my legs at school, in primary school, and I should have been because that is actually the definition of being treated equally is like kids all tease each other about all sorts of different sure. things and it should never have been off limits and i'm like gr so unbelievably grateful that that was the case there would have been nothing worse and there is nothing worse than like n in that capacity like something being off limits and when it's off limits that actually comes from a place of being above someone so like the fact that everything was on the board growing up was the best
Well, the warm weather has finally arrived, and that means outdoor living, looking for cooler indoors, and breaking out possibly the tool belt for all your DIY and home improvement projects. Yep, you might be one of the many thousands of Kiwis thinking about those home improvement jobs. Trade Depot is your one-stop shop, whatever you're up to. With over four and a half thousand, that's right, four and a half thousand quality home improvement projects across bathrooms, kitchens, appliances, and much, much more. Trade Depot has you sorted for any project. And most appliances have a two-year warranty. Trade Depot is 100% New Zealand owned. So they understand where you're coming from. They believe you don't have to pay a premium for good quality products. But neither should you throw your money away on low quality items. And the more you spend, the more you save. Get 4% off orders over two and a half grand and up to 8% off orders over $8,000. T's and C's apply. Get more bang for your buck with low prices always at Trade Depot. Check out tradedepot.co.nz or call into one of their three stores, Auckland, Christchurch and the new Superstore in Hamilton near the airport. It wasn't always the case that you were going to, you know, have the story that you've had and be a Paralympian, be a, a, a high achieving guy who's well known. Um, you, you know, we've talked about some obvious, you know, tough stuff, the fibula, hemimelia. Um, your mum died, I think I'm right to say, when you were 18. Mm -hmm, correct. Cancer. Yeah, correct. I mean, that's. Um, always going to be among the worst things that can ever happen to a young person um, and then what we also know because I think it was in the media I mean as you were um, a young guy varsity, I, I, doing commerce mm -hmm, correct yeah I did a commerce degree and you know you're drinking you're smoking dope you're um, you're going the wrong way um, and you have a car crash sort of literally and metaphorically yeah, exactly. And it all hit a peak. I mean, I was just uh, post 18. My mum dies. I moved to Perth. Uh, I arrive in Perth. I find out that my you know, my brother's a, a meth addict over there. And uh, I eventually come back to the University of Canterbury. They led in a bunch of students who shouldn't have got in after the earthquake. I was one of those students. And I was drinking all the time, partying all the time. And I just had no direction whatsoever. And there were a number of events that happened, like uh, and before the car crash, but everything led up to the car crash. And it was following that event that I decided to turn everything around. And, you know, we know, you noted that my life wasn't always on this trajectory and that's true. But despite that, I was always a dreamer. So I was always extremely ambitious. And as a child, I was always extremely ambitious and had like high unrealistic hopes for myself. And I never let those go, despite the fact that my sets of, you know, actions, were, were not necessarily going to lead me in, in that pathway. Yeah, because you said something earlier and I sort of had clocked it, um, it which was like, because I decided I was going to be an Olympic world champion or a Paralympic world champion. Because it was the easiest thing to do. But it was kind of like, well, you decided, well, no, you decided to have a go at it, but of course you did get there. Right? Yeah, but I decided and, that that was going to be. Yeah. But it was obvious. That and, was, but that's, you know, at a level that's dreaming, right? But, but I mean, no, it wasn't. Well, no. It wasn't because for you it was realistic, but... It was the most obvious thing to do. It was the that was the easiest thing to do was going to the Paralympics. Um, like one of the you know a great piece of advice is that competition is for losers, and you can think about that in like if in a business capacity, going and starting a restaurant might be one of the most competitive things you can do. Most restaurants go under. I think the like professional version of that is most people go out and they try to do like a CFA or become a lawyer. It's an endless grind. It's very hard to get to the top, and the rewards aren't that high. The Paralympics, if you looked at it, well, not many people can go to the Paralympics because most people aren't disabled. It had gotten to a point where it was enough in the public eye that you could create value by going. And in particular, my predecessor, Pistorius, had been, for both good and big bad, time. big time, had been in the media. Did you meet him? Uh, no, but talked to him on Skype in between his murder trial, which was wild. Yeah. And so when you looked at that, I thought I could go to the Paralympics. Not many people are doing it. Uh, no one else is going to enter it. No one's going to chop their legs off to go to the Paralympics yet. And so 
uh, despite the fact that I wasn't an athlete, I hadn't run in like seven years, I was pretty confident I could get there. And so that versus doing other things like starting a business, I had the idea of climbing Mount Cook, but like there's not that much value in climbing Mount Cook, risk losing my hands as well, look like Patrick Starr from SpongeBob, all these different ideas. Going to the going to the Paralympics was the obvious, easiest, most sensible thing I could do in terms of creating value, being unique, monopolizing myself, and being able to go and do other things. That's that's why I went to the Paralympics. I didn't have this pursuit of like, I want to be a Paralympian, I want to be passionate about changing the world with disabilities it was like it was very strategic and i understand and, I, and what you say all makes rational sense although you know i decided to be prime minister and that didn't happen i mean that you know people can make d- decisions and have a view of something and it doesn't come through and not everyone in fact like you say nearly everyone doesn't win a gold medal uh, at the paralympics uh, um I, I wasn't going to but i just interested in what you said about um pistorius i mean what a weird sort of situation there what what was your impression let me of- give you an insight that no one else can give you i grew up on a farm my mum was often down in christchurch battling cancer my dad was often away so either there was one parent home in my teen years or no parents home at some times um most nights i would have slept with my legs off back then and it was there was an overwhelming sense of paranoia and it was very common for me to sleep uh, with like a knife or something beside my bed in the sense, like that's living in New Zealand in a safe farming community because you feel so vulnerable without your limbs. When news broke that Oscar had shot his girlfriend in South Africa, my immediate thought was, holy shit, that makes sense because I felt like that historically uh and at that point at that point in time when it happened i was at university so like i'd felt As like a result, that, and, and you're saying that the double the, the, the fact of being an amputee feeds well, in it feeds into that because if you were to if someone was to break in while i was asleep with my legs off there's no chance for me to say to an intruder pause for two seconds let me throw on my legs and try to mess around with the velcro and the duct tape before we you know before i defend myself so i get that by the way, I'm not defending him and saying that he's innocent. I'm just saying that I can, from my point of view, my initial first reaction was that makes sense to me wow. because I felt like that. Wow. Um, I, I don't want to come back to your um, car crash. How did you come out of that? What happened that's made you say, right, I'm getting on track? Well, I was amb- I wanted to be ambitious and I wanted to be successful and just nothing was happening. And it was enough of an event. It was a significant event that it forced me to make a change and assess the way that I reacted to things like my mum dying and having artificial legs. Like, ah, those things are tough, but how you react to them is what really drives those outcomes. And so it was that self-awareness in combination with you know, the fact that if my mom was still alive, it would have disappointed her. My dad was alive, S- seriously disappointed him, mm-hmm. disappointed a lot of my friends, and I have very, very good friends. And so, you know, it was the right set of interventions and the right set of, I guess, self-motivation to turn things around. Friends around you were a great support. And epic, get yeah. I have epic friends. Amazing. Hey, um, today, do you consider yourself disabled? Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, in some capacity, certainly. Because well, I ask that because I think I've I, I think I've read you saying you don't necessarily. I mean, is it what? I don't in the sense of like my attitude, like from an, from a point of view that like do, do I have any self doubt in trying anything? Absolutely not. Like I have my skydive license. I can snowboard, Amazing. wakeboard. You know, I do more things than most able bodied people. I'm in better shape than most able bodied people. So in that capacity, I don't view myself as disabled. I don't think it restricts me in achieving any of my dreams. Functionally, is there a disability? Absolutely. If I want to go out and party for a night on the town, it's very hard for me. I can't stand up all night. It's extremely painful. Right. Like beyond an hour, I'm in an 8 out of 10 pain. Yeah. And so there are certain physical like realities that are tied to being an amputee that are disabling. At like a broader level, is it restricting on my life? Absolutely not. It seems to me there is that, and I, as I say, I don't understand it, this politics around the words and the terminology we meant to use. Am I getting it right, or what? What? Um, 
should Dude, we, be, I, I don't, should we I, be hung up no, on No, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. I, I cared a little bit when I was younger when you're caught up in identity stuff, but like, uh, it's so unnecessary. Like, I couldn't care. You could call me whatever. Disabled, what, who cares? What the, It doesn't change the functional reality of having two artificial legs. I don't think you could use whatever term you wanted. At the end of the day, there's like a... I suppose you're a strong person. Some might not be as strong, though. That's not going to help them. Simon, that's not going to help them. Um, you've, it seems to me, used the cards you were dealt as an opportunity, not as a dis- a yeah, disadvantage. Yeah, correct. Correct. Um, yeah. And you know I mean, run me through that. You think it could have gone differently, or do you feel today, as you look back, you know what? That was it, that was how it was going to be, because I had the oomph. The oomph to go for it. Well, it wasn't just the oomph. I had like a set of experiences that led me to having a certain worldview and a certain view of having my disability. And beyond anything, it was the way that my parents treated me. It could have gone differently. Perhaps I have some sort of survivor bias. But you can look around the world and you can see all sorts of different types of people with all sorts of constraints on their lives and they've managed to succeed. And... And I think that serves in an, as an example for not ever having an excuse in any capacity. Um, I also watched my mum for six years battle cancer, and it didn't stop her one day. She could have chemotherapy, radiation, we, we were on a farm. She would still be farming. She would watch my dad try and do things on the farm, become frustrated. She has a colostomy bag on the side of her stomach, which is which you know her, her bowels go into and she'd be having chemotherapy and ready and she would still be getting out there so i've seen very she was a very very tough person on herself on me and that serves as like a driver to not give up and then i think i'm a big reader and so i've read a lot of books i love history and there's a lot of people throughout the world who have overcome great difficulty and i think you look at that and you go like ah my life's pretty easy what sort of books do you like um all sorts of books. I like fiction, non-fiction, fantasy, sci-fi. I like finance books, historical books, all sorts of books. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask you a problematic question, but I, it's on the back of some things I think you've said. Um, if you could go back and wave a magic wand, would you be born with two perfect legs? I'm going to say yes. I, I think that the... This is how I would explain it. The net suffering over the arc of my life will be severe enough that I think having two real legs would be more beneficial. The counter to that is if I was born in Nelson with two real legs, the probability is that I probably would have become a builder or a plumber down in <laughs> Nelson. Got, well, that's my next thing to yeah, you. So I've got I, this quite I, so it's, I feel lucky I have no legs. If I didn't have no legs, I would be the most boring basic dude from Nelson and I'd have nothing different about me I'd probably build a bu- be a builder in quite. not that there's anything wrong with being well, a builder well that was my next one too but, but. but I think it's been the almost but, the perfect set of constraints to push me in directions that I'm very lucky to to go in I mean adversity breeds character it does and it pushed you in a different direction that's why I say problematic question it's ridiculous the way you are who you are and you know you make and make decisions on the basis of that. But, um, yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with being a builder. Uh, but you were in... You're I in... wish I was good at building. I just built the fence <laughs> for my dog and he escaped. Any good? So, well, uh, horrendous fence. Useless. Since the Paralympics, um, you're, you've are been on the speaking circuit. You, you're bloody good at that. I've seen the TED Talk. Um, are you doing much of that now? Not within, not within my daily working yep. life. Stand-up comedy? Gave that a shot and that was really just about, um, I think that you should always try and pursue new things outside of the scope of your, I guess, capabilities. So I was living in London. I was working for a very cool New Zealand tech company, traveling the world. And I didn't have a whole lot of friends in London and uh, I was watching a lot of Netflix. Anyway, I decided that I'd go to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, largest arts festival in the world. I don't know how many artists go. Thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people go through Edinburgh to watch it. Usually people would spend years performing like a craft, whether it's theatre or stand-up or some form of other performing art, before going. They would run a tour somewhere and then they would take that show to the Fringe Festival. I set this goal six months beforehand. 
managed to get myself a venue that I shouldn't have got and just like went to pub after pub <laughs> every single night, told jokes for five minutes, didn't get any laughs, went home, <laughs> cried myself to sleep. And I arrive at the Fringe Festival and the general statistic is that like the average audience size is like four people. Most artists go there, they lose a bunch of money. It's a horrible experience. It's a fun experience, but a horrible experience. I arrive on the first night and the staff come outside the venue as I'm arriving. They say, congrats, you sold out the first week. How did you do it? And as they say that, the Scottish Disability Association bus shows up outside the venue. <laughs> and I'm thinking, shit, I've made... My whole show is jokes about these people, and the whole first week was a bunch of disabled people coming to my show, uh, and they were the best audiences that I had. And how did it They were awesome. They were absolutely awesome. Laugh? I'm not gonna, they laughed? laughed. Laughed the whole time. Yeah, I'm not going to repeat the jokes. I'll get cancelled. No, no. Yeah, no, don't. They, they were. They were fantastic. Oh, how how funny. So really, why didn't you keep going with that? You didn't sort of feel you had a future as. I would get cancelled. One. Right. That was the big one. And there's like... Word of our podcast, problematic. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. you go. Um, get cancelled. You know, you have to make some estimation on whether or not you're going to succeed. <laughs> I was not going <laughs> to succeed. And um, yeah. No, fair uh, call. Yeah. yeah. And well, now you're it. in the tech world. And um, so I think the business you're talking about, Soul Machines, which obviously I know of, AI. Um, now you're at Amazon. Um I think I'm right to say you've been involved in startups. You would have had a lot of opportunities and options before you. Why did you get into the tech world? Well, again, it goes back to being anti-competitive, trying to be, and looking at the mean of the outcomes within those competitions. It's like, think about it as like, the yeah, you were a lawyer, right, historically? Yep. And it's like, I guess most people that go through law, regardless of where they end up, they grind. It's like 80-hour weeks for a lot of young absolutely people. right. It's a grind, and they don't earn a lot now. That's a, a lot don't, you're right. For the hours that they work and the stress that they take. Yep. The same is true of finance. They work huge hours, they grind, there's a lot of people doing it, a lot of very smart people doing it. And by and large, that's because those industries have become saturated and they've matured, and there's not a lot of growth left in them. The opposite is true of technology, especially of the big technology companies. So the average person in a technology company they are incredibly bright, they're incredibly talented, and yes, they work hard, but their outcomes are a lot better. And you, if you work at any of the big, you know, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Amazon, the work-life benefits are immense, the opportunities are more immense, and for those reasons, it makes sense to work in technology. And then, naturally, I'm inclined intellectually towards the technology side of things, which makes it satisfying and interesting and, and everything else that comes with it but does so, that make sense yeah it does i yeah. know it does make sense to me and so but it's a lot like what you were saying to me about going you were going to win at the paralympics you really have a thought process you're working through it and you're quite and i don't mean this in a bad way i think it's a good thing you're quite calculating in terms of why you've done that are you um what's a normal work week look for you you work big hours or i do work big hours but not relative to weekends are off weekends are absolutely off yeah and working at amazon i do believe is the best company on earth naturally i'm going to say that i'm biased and i don't have to say that but it is a phenomenal company to work for i would probably work 50 hours a week 60 hours a week right and um how do you feel about the tech sector or sectors really in new zealand i mean um, are we an innovation nation that's got to do amazing and is doing amazing things? Is a bit undercooked? What's your, do you have any views I think on that? That's a broad geopolitical question, Simon. <laughs> is that above both our pay rate grades, possibly? Uh, it's well above my pay grade to make that that judgment. I would well, I thought say, I'd give you the opportunity. Yeah, I don't know. I just felt like you might. I think there's a lot of great people doing great things in this country, and I think. I think the underlying question of what you're asking is like, do we become a technology centric country in the future? Like, is that our future? I don't know. I don't know if that's like determined for New Zealand. I think we've got a lot of challenges to get across before that might be possible. Um, I feel like we're a little bit behind the eight ball. We've got, we, we could, but sort of open to us. I think we, we could make of, it. Perhaps not smashing think, down the doors we need to. Here's some things I think would make it easier. I don't think we need to send kids to university until they're 22. I think right. that's a giant waste of time. I think right. high school, for the most part now, is advanced babysitting. And I think we could reduce the barriers to making 
uh, attempts at building great technology companies in New Zealand. And then on top of that, we could have a much greater set of incentives to bring technology companies to New Zealand to foster uh, development because you, the best training you're going to get for a society is actually going to come from companies that will get outcomes as a result of having trained staff. And so I think we could we could have a set of policy, Simon, if you ever want to go back into politics, that you could implement that would encourage It's a bit that. like law, Liam. <laughs> <laughs> Long hours, not a lot of pay. Um, yeah, well, no, enough. look, it's all relative. I know there'd be people saying they say they, they, they're overpaid and terrible people and all those things. But anyway, I'm, see, I'm glad I asked you that question. Look at what you gave me. We had educational reform. We had it all going on there. What's um? You're th- you're not even thirty. You've won medals. You've you know um, done stand up comedy at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. You've you got yourself now on a successful tra- trajectory in in the tech world. You know one of the most sort of vibrant slash glamorous kind of sectors. Um, what's the future hold? Well, I definitely have a family at some point. I think that's super important. Um, beyond that, I think career-wise, acquire a company and then build it. Um, beyond Tech? No. Or that not restaurant the you opposite. were talking about? No, no, not restaurant and not technology. Liam's pad thai? <laughs> that is a... You know what? I do do a good pad thai. <laughs> I'm not bad at cooking. Although I tried to follow Miss Polly's Kitchen. Do you know her? She's like Instagram famous. Uh, yes. You should get her on. She's phenomenal. Yes. Uh, I tried to follow Polly, one of her. Come on. Yeah, I tried to follow one of her recipe, recipes that has that like Italian sausage paste, New Jersey or something. I'm, I'm no, butchering that. I'm, Any Italians yeah. listening, do not yes. do not come after me for that Ninja. pronunciation. Don't I put worry. way there's, too much. There's in. other things in this I podcast that come over yeah, you. From. Don't worry about it. Not that hours one. Hours <laughs> making this this recipe from Miss Polly's Instagram and butchered it. I had one little sip. You know, you taste it with the, the spoon. Inedible. It was disgusting. Not that I, it was, you know, my fault, not hers. But so yeah. what would be the single best thing you would cook in your repertoire, your armory of chef-like meals, and your romantic night with Madison in before kind of, I don't know, some Danish crime thriller on Netflix? Some form of lamb, red wine combination. Beautiful. Anything with meat, well, uh, I'm your guy. You're making me feel romantic. <laughs> It's uh, that's fantastic. Well, you can join. We'll kick, we'll kick Madison out, mate. Come round, grab Wonderful. your popcorn. We're going to end with uh, questions we ask everyone. We call it general knowledge. What single object would you save from your house in the event of a well, fire? <laughs> this is, it's, it's, yes, yes. Well, I mean, if like obviously, I'm putting on my legs. Those are objects, right? So that's a given. Given. Beyond that. Yeah, I think so. Beyond that, yes. iPhone and anyone who says anything else but their phone is lying. <laughs> because I guarantee so you, right. I guarantee well, well, you, you it'll be re- the, the only you... useful object inside anyone else's anyone, anyone Well, it's else's got all your house. photos. And let's face it, you've got exactly. to ring the fire brigade. And it's a better tool, right? Like, what else can you bring from your house that you can actually use immediately to, like, have some sort of function. It's the power of the tech company, exactly. my friend. That's exactly. what's going on there. Um, what's the best night out you've ever had? I once received a phone call from the woman who was the CEO of Vogue, the fashion magazine. She said, do you know anything about modeling? I lied and I said, yes. <laughs> I knew nothing about modeling. I'd seen Zoolander and I knew the blue steel pose. And I, I knew a few models, you know. Ah, how could ah, how, how oh, it be? Yeah, exactly. John Key's done it. A- exactly. And if John can do it... <laughs> So she flies me out to New York. I'm at the one of the most expensive fashion shows at New York Fashion Week, and they had this large industrial uh, hangar that they filled with like a foot of snow. Now every celebrity you can imagine was there, like Fergie and Leonardo DiCaprio and Snoop Dogg, and they put me in my blades and like this weird little lycra outfit. It was odd to say the least, right? And I was like, surely at some point someone will give me guidance, a tutorial. I have no idea how to model. <laughs> Anyway, I'm the last model. I'm there for diversity reasons. The last model to walk, they just say, go. I take two steps. I lock eye contact with Snoop Dogg in the front row. He'd seen me and my blades <laughs> and the light crack. Honestly, it looked like he'd just seen Mr. Tumnus from the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> I love Dude, that Mr. Tumnus, yeah, by the way. So, yeah, I can um, still see the picture from <clears throat> the book my mum read me. I thought he was dubious. Uh... He panicked. He kind of had this reaction. It made me panic. It was muscle memory. I just started running along the outside of all the models on this runway. I ran around the outside of all of them. I passed the one who's in the front, by the way. And I run backstage. And as I ran past Kareen Reutfeld, this incredible fashion mogul, 
She put her head in her hands, and I'm thinking, I've scalped her. I'm backstage. The lead designer walks up to me. He looks at me. He goes, you are a genius. <laughs> <laughs> he takes me back out for the final walk, and then I get this phone call, and this agent says, hey, do you want to have dinner with Fergie from the Black Eyed Peas? She saw you tonight. I'm like, sure. And my ego goes, I'm being asked on a date with Fergie. I arrive at this event. It's not a date. It's not a one-on-one with Fergie. It's a fundraiser for the Special Olympics. She saw me and she thought I went to the Special Olympics, not the Paralympics. So the whole night I'm having dinner with Fergie and she's talking to me in 0.5 speed. Highly, (laughs) I was painful. So it was a wild, wild like arc of unexpected events and it was absolutely hilarious. That would be the best night out because it was just so That's some seriously good name dropping you've got going on there. Mm, Yeah, it was weird. Fergie. And this is an, because I was just caught up in so much that was going on there. This is at New York. Yeah, in New York. Amazing. This before or after you'd win Paralympics? After. Right, amazing. Yeah. Um, what's the best advice given to you and who gave it? Uh, probably my dad, like waking up in proportion to your talents. Like the time you wake up should be in proportion to your talents. So I think he was saying you need to get up very early in the morning, if that makes sense, yeah. and work hard. So, yeah. And I think that's true. I feel like I've had similar advice from mine dad yeah long ago hey it's been great to have you liam i wish you all the very best for the future you've been listening to generally famous with me simon bridges this is the final episode of this season but i'll be back in a few weeks with more brilliant guests if you're a new listener you can find every episode at stuff.co.nz slash generally famous or wherever you get your podcasts although we're taking a short break we will be releasing some bonus shows If you follow us on Apple or Spotify, any of the podcasts and apps, in fact, you'll get them automatically. Thanks to my producers, Chris Reed and Jen Black. Thanks to all my guests so far. And thanks to you for listening. I really appreciate it. Generally Famous is proudly brought to you by Trade Depot. Generally famous for low prices, always. Kiwis are now travelling to Trade Depot Hamilton Airport to visit the world's biggest bathroom, kitchen and appliance superstore. Here you'll find thousands of new premium products from world-leading designers and manufacturers. Trade Depot's bulk buying power means you'll save thousands on home renovation products. It's worth visiting Trade Depot at Hamilton Airport, the world's biggest bathroom, kitchen and appliance superstore. Trade Depot.